10 minutes still. Everybody comes in and makes sure we're ready. Am I on? I don't sound like you're on. Am I on? You're, you're on. Okay. Now we got it. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church this morning. Hopefully everybody's not too sore. I've been hearing some moaning and groaning this morning from yesterday's work day. Uh, we had a very productive work day, so we're thankful for everybody that came out and that was a part of that. Just a few announcements for you this morning. If you have your bulletins on your phone or in the back of your chairs, Mother's Day is coming up. There's going to be no evening services on Monday. And then following that, Senior Recognition Sunday, lunch will be provided after the services. And then uh, we're still working out the details of the block party, so if you're looking forward to the block party announcements, uh, sign up list to help out and everything that's going to be going on there. Uh, church camp is still scheduled for the beginning of June. See Mason if you have any uh, questions or comments about church camp for the youth. And then, Ms. Teresa, you ready to put that one slide for me? The call. So, Ms. Joy is going to be our POC for the call. This is uh, information. There's going to be a meeting on May 4th, an in informational meeting, if you're interested in fostering children or adoption. We actually have some people in the church that have actually used this before. Uh, so get with Miss Joy. It's a wonderful, wonderful program if you are interested in adopting or fostering children. So moving from there, we're going to pray. For, I'm going to pray for us real quick. We're going to turn it over to the band. We don't have a whole lot of time. We're, we're behind schedule. So. <laughs> All right. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we, uh, we come to you this morning, Lord. Lord, we're thankful to be in a country to where we can come and to be together as a body of believers and lift up the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, Lord, our Redeemer. Father, as we enter into this time of, of, uh, of praising Jesus Christ, our, our worship, Lord, I, I pray that our voices would, would magnify and exalt his name. I pray that we would come together. And Lord, I pray that we would set all of our distractions aside this morning, that we would recognize that we come here for one reason, and that's, that, that's to serve a living Savior serve our living Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, as we as we enter into this time, Lord, I pray that you would help us to set all of our distractions aside. Help us to, to focus in on the message that you have for us this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would move in and amongst these people this morning, and, and, Father, that we would hear from you this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Be with us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
we do have one more song, but we're going to pause for a little bit of corporate prayer and reflection. And it's uh, my only thought for this day. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. Do you realize what a backward thought process that is to the people of the world? The thing that our world is the most afraid of, we have the power to rejoice in through Christ Jesus. That's all I got. That's simple. That's simple. But if you can wrap your mind around Man, it's powerful. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we are so thankful. We're thankful to be called your people. We're thankful that even in the darkest times that this life can throw at us, we can rejoice because we have a peace and a hope that endures. We know with certainty that our Savior has already conquered death and sin and hell. So that we don't have to feel the pain of those things. Yes, God, in times of death, you have built us in a way that we mourn and we weep. But in relationship with you, we understand that in accordance with Scripture, the sorrow may last through the night, but your joy comes with the morning. Through an understanding of your word, we understand that we're blessed when we mourn. But God, through an understanding of your word, we recognize that death is not the end. We believe that. Not even close. We recognize that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, the first fruits of the resurrection, so that we could follow. And God, we live in that this morning, and the beauty, and the power of it. God, we ask that you increase our faith, increase our understanding, and continue to stir us toward you. We do pray that this would be a place that people can come to find hope, to find peace, to find comfort, but not in the people of Fellowship Baptist Church, no, in the God that we serve, that we can share the hope that's in us with those that we encounter. Praise your name this morning for being the God that gives us hope. Hope, not in the human sense that this is some nice faraway thing that we think might potentially happen and we long for and we want, but hope in the scriptural sense, a certain expectation that you went away to prepare a place so that you can gather us unto yourself that where you are, we may be also. God, we rejoice in that this morning. And we praise you. You are great and you are greatly to be praised. We pray all of these things in Christ's name.
give some thankful for this day. God, all of the things that we mentioned in this song are things that we recognize as blessings from you. God, we recognize that you are the creator, not just of our world, but of everything that is seen and unseen in our universe. And somehow in the midst of that story, of that grand creation, God, we recognize that you took time to take a special interest in us, to make us different. Of all the things on all the planets surrounding all the stars in all of the galaxies, you created us to be special, to be unique, to be your image bearers in this place. God, you created us and we rejected. Because of that, you had to purchase us back to a world that we had sold ourselves into. But you freely and gladly did exactly that. So now, having been both created and purchased by you, God, we are doubly yours. God, we yield ourselves to you this day, asking you to take our lives and do what you see fit to your own honor and glory. God, we pray that as your word is open, that your word would go out and in accordance with scripture when it does, it would not return for it. But God, that it would make an impact in the hearts and lives that it touches this morning. God, we know that you have guided Ray in his studies. We know that you poured into him because we know that you called him. So God, we ask now that you guide his speech. Let the words that we hear be the words that you've intended for us in your foresight and your knowledge. God, we pray that your name is glorified in this place by whatever means necessary. It's in Christ's name. If you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to continue our study through the book of 1 Thessalonians this morning. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And if you have your Bible as well, I'm going to use a passage this morning to illustrate the passage in 1 Thessalonians. If you would, Mark chapter 4. Mark, Mark chapter 4 as well. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4. Today, as well as 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'll give you a moment to mark both of those. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and Mark chapter 4. Well, it's good to be back. Uh, as many as you know, I was on vacation last week with my family, and as we were singing that last song, my vacation came back to my mind. How great thou art. We went to the Creation Museum last weekend, as well as the Ark, and if I could only describe to you what we saw or put it in words, it would be, how great thou art. How great of a God we do serve, and, and it was really put out very well. It was explained very well. We, we, we got to walk through the Creation Museum, and what it described and what it showed us was how God created a good and a perfect earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. And we, we walked through that, and we saw that God created everything, and it was good in his sight, and that we were meant to walk with God and have a relationship with God, but then man distorted that. Man sinned against God, and and what the effects of that were, were, now we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. And as we were singing that song, how, how great thou art. 
He's made everything. Do you look into the skies and see the stars? Do you see the sun? Do you see the moon? Do you see how it reflects his glory? When you see the sun rise and the sun set, do you think of how great thou art? When you see the beauty that nature has to offer butterflies and birds and animals, flowers, do you think how great thou art? That's what I was thinking this morning as we were singing that song. If you get the opportunity, I would strongly encourage you to visit Noah's Ark and the Creation Museum in Kentucky. This morning we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Before we get there, I want to quote a few very well-known pastors to you this morning. David Wilkerson says this. He says, we are obsessed with entertainment in God's house. We have a hatred of correction. We have a hatred of reproof. He said, nobody wants to hear it anymore. Bob Utley says, a true salvation has observable characteristics. And the goal of salvation is not a ticket to heaven. John MacArthur says, the narrow gate is hard to find. And it's hard to go through. Because it demands denial of self. Denial of self-righteousness. Recognition of sin, full repentance, submission to Christ, a commitment to obey him, and to follow him no matter what the cost. Again, David Wilkerson says we are preaching an acceptable gospel. We're making it as painless as we can. He said we need some hellfire preaching on repentance. Bob Utley says, he says he's sick of dead, denominational, cultural Christianity that carries a cross around their neck, but not a crucified Savior in their heart. MacArthur says, I am convinced in the name of Christianity, there are many places that call themselves churches, and they're not churches. They have men that call themselves pastors who are not pastors. And they have congregations that call themselves Christians who are not Christians. Paul Washer says in a sermon to his congregation years ago, he said this to his congregation. He said, what gives him sleepless nights is that within a with, within hundred years, a great majority of the people in this building will possibly be in hell. He says, many who profess Jesus as Lord in the church will spend an eternity in hell. Matthew 7.21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. I hope I've grabbed your attention this morning. Heaven is real. Hell is hot. And the gospel message is offensive. If you find your place in 1 Thessalonians, I invite you to stand in reverence for God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word this morning. We will begin in verse 13. He said, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. And they have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they may be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. I want to bring you a message this morning, I've titled, 
receiving God's word the right way. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning in prayer. Lord, I ask that you would hide me behind the cross, Lord, that you would give me your words to speak. Lord, that you would fill my mouth with your thoughts and your words. God, I pray that these words would go out to a congregation. They would go out to your people and they would not come back void. Lord, I pray that there's somebody in here, if there's somebody in here that needs to hear this message, I pray that they would receive your word the right way. That's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the word of God going out and how it's received. And Father God, I pray that this message would impact the lives of your people this morning, that they would they would understand the right way to receive God's word. Lord God, this message is near and dear to my heart because it's real. It's real. I pray right now that your Holy Spirit, Spirit would, would fill this room, fill, fill us with your presence, Lord, that, that we would hear from you this morning. Show us the truths of your text, that we may be changed from the text. We love you. Thank you. In Christ's name. The first thing Paul points out to the church of Thessalonica is how they received the word of God. Verse 13 says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. He, he starts this this how they receive, but he, but he starts with thanking God, just like he did in chapter 1 when he was talking to the church about, about their salvation. He thanked God in chapter 1 for their salvation. He's again thanking God in chapter 2 for their, for their salvation. What Paul knows is that God gets the glory, God gets the credit. And he says, we, we thank God without ceasing. Paul understands that, that God is opening people's eyes to the reality of the sin in their life. He understands that there is nothing he can do as a preacher to save somebody. He understands that there's nothing you can do in and of yourself to save yourself. That God gets the glory. He, he's continually thanking God. He says, for this reason we thank God without ceasing. It's a continual thanking. Paul, Timothy, and Silas, they were continually thanking God because they understood that the mighty hand of God was at work in their lives. He thanked God for how they received the word. He says, the word of God which you heard from us, you, you heard it from the preachers, from the apostles, but you welcomed it not as our word, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Paul said they received the word as truth and that it really is God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, the Bible is God's word. It is God's words to us, his literal words to us. Everything God wants you to know about himself is contained within this book. He says, you received it as truth, the real word of God. That's how the Thessalonians received it. But what this is implying is that there's another way to receive the word of God. There's another way that they could have received it. Look at verse 13 again. It says, they received it as in truth, the true word of God. But there's, obviously, that they could have received it as the word of men. They could have received it as man's word if they wouldn't have received it as the word of God. They could have taken Paul and Timothy and Silas's stories and, and taken them as stories. But check this out. They could have actually believed the stories that they were preaching. They were preaching Christ crucified. That Christ came and he is the answer. He is the man to bring us back to God. He is the man who was died, who, who did these miracles and who was buried and rose again. And check this out. They could have actually believed that and still received the message wrong. They could have believed that Jesus Christ is the answer. They could have believed that he really did raise from the dead and still received the message wrong. Paul says there's a right way to receive the message. But Paul says there's a wrong way to receive the message. If you marked your 
Bibles in Mark chapter 4. I want to use this passage to illustrate, I believe, what, what Paul is saying here. In this passage, Jesus is, is, is telling his disciples a parable. He, he's telling them the famous parable of the seed sower. And there's, there's four different types of seeds here. Verse 4 is our first seed. It says, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. The second seed is found in verse 5. It says, some seed fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and it immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. The third seed is in verse, verse 7. It says, some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And then verse 8 is the fourth seed. It says, but other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up and it increased and produced some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100. You see, Paul wasn't thankful that they heard the gospel. Paul wasn't thankful that they went to church. Paul wasn't thankful that they claimed to be Christian. He wasn't thankful that they claimed to be Christ followers. How did Paul know that they fell on good ground? How did Paul know that they were genuine, real Christians? Because of the results. Because of the results in their life. Look at verse 13 and 14. It says, we're going to start in the middle of 13. It says, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The word of God is effectively working in their lives. For you, brethren, who, look, became imitators of the church of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen. He's saying the word of God was effective in your life. It did something. It's working in you. This is how you became imitators of Christ. The gospel message is effectively changing who they are. It's working in them. The gospel has that effect on people. If they are truly saved, there should be evidence in their life. It's not that it's, it's not this, it's not that they, it should effectively work in their life. It's not that you should be changed. It's that you will be changed. If you are a true child of God this morning, there will be evidence in your life that you were really changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's like having, it's like having really bad vision. If, if you have really bad vision and you're, you're given a brand new pair of glasses for the first time ever, you can now see clearly. Being a child of God, is, you, you can see yourself for what you really are. You can see God for who he really is. You can see sin for what sin really is. You start to hate the things you once loved, and you start to love the things you once hated. The worldly things in your life begin to lose their appeal. Godly things begin to motivate you and drive you in your everyday life. You begin to love spending time in God's Word. You begin to love spending time in the presence of God in prayer. It's things that you've never cared about before. When you were lost, you didn't care about the Bible. You didn't care about getting to know God. You didn't care about a relationship with Him. You didn't care about reading His Word, spending time in His Word, spending time in prayer. Once you're a child of God, those things, it's like getting that pair of glasses. You're going to want those things. Your inner desire in your heart is going to desire time with God, desire to get to know Him. You start living for eternity, and you stop living every day for yourself. The reality, you, you cannot remain the same person after being converted. That's what the definition of converted is. It's to be changed. You can't be converted without change. He says, I, I know it is effectively working in you because you have become imitators of the church. There's evidence. I know the gospel is working in your life. You are being transformed. You are imitating Christ. You are imitating other true believers. You're imitating the church. You're imitating us as the apostles. It's like he said, he's saying this essentially. He's saying, if you receive the word as the truth of God, it equals an effective work in your life. If you receive the word as the truth from God, it equals an effective work in your life. You will become imitators of Christ. 
The other side of that coin is if you receive the word not as truth, if you just hear the word, there equals no change in your life. You, you do not become imitators of Christ. If you receive it correctly, if, if, if you receive the word of God and it becomes the authority over your life and you seek to obey it and live by the word of God, it equals, it has to, it will affect your life. You will become imitators of Christ. He says the effective work of the gospel is evident because you're living a changed life. You're living a Christ-like life. Go back to Mark chapter 4. Verse 15 says, and these are the ones by the wayside. Verse 15 says, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word was sown. Look at this. When they hear, when they hear the word of God, Satan comes and immediately takes the word away which was sown in their heart. They heard the word. But this is the seed that fell by the wayside. These people hear the word, and it makes no impact on their lives. That They hear it, they harden their hearts to it, and they reject it. But verse 16 says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who, look at this, when they hear the word, they immediately receive it. These people have heard the word, they received the word, and they received it with gladness. They, but they, they, they've heard that Christ has come to, to save them from their sins, and they're joyful. They're happy. They receive it with gladness. They rejoice. But look, but they have no root in themselves, so they only endure for a short time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. This seed on the stony ground, these people hear the word, they receive the word with gladness. It brings joy to their heart. But they have no root. They have no root. As long as things are going the way they want them to in their lives, they're fine. They're fine with following Jesus Christ as long as everything is okay. Jesus Christ had thousands and thousands and thousands of followers. They followed him because of his miracles, his miracle workings. His, he was feeding them. He was performing miracles. He was healing them. He was giving them bread and water. But as soon as persecution arose, as soon as things got hard, as soon as things got difficult, they turned away. That's these people. These people. And, and I'll follow Jesus as long as my bills are paid. I'll follow Jesus as long as I have a nice house, as long as there's a car in my driveway that I like. I'll follow Jesus as long as everything is going okay. But as soon as things turn from the way I want them to go, they depart. They leave their faith. Paul's thanking God in verses 13 and 14. He, he was thanking the Thessalonians. He was thanking God that when the Thessalonians faced persecution, they didn't fall away. They didn't stumble. They stayed the course. Verse 18 says, now these are the ones sown among thorns. That they, they are the ones who, again, hear the word. They've all heard the word of God. And the, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and become unfruitful. This seed hears the word again and they receive it. But the cares of the world overtook the true message of God. Other things were more important to them than the truth of God's word. Other things, the, the verse actually says, the cares of the world and the desire for other things was more important. It, it impacted them more than the gospel. And we read that and we're, we think, what could possibly be more important than God's word? What, what could possibly be more important to them than God's word? We think this is crazy, but we do it every day in our own lives. We do it every day. Every day, we're faced with thousands of decisions. We get up, what do I want to eat for breakfast? What do I want to eat for lunch, dinner, what clothes do I want to wear? What car do I want to drive? Every day, we make thousands of decisions. And every single day, we make decisions whether we want to strengthen our relationship with Christ, whether we want to spend time in God's Word, whether we want to spend time in prayer. Every day. Every day you have that decision to strengthen your relationship with Christ, to spend time with Christ, to get to know Christ. How many times do we say, I could read my Bible tonight, but I think I'll watch that movie instead. I think I'll catch up on my Netflix series instead. I think I'll go watch my favorite TV show instead of spending time in God's Word or in, in time with God in prayer. That's other things being more important. That's what that's talking about. 
Verse 20 says, but these are the ones sown on the good ground. Those who, again, hear the word. All four seeds heard the word. They were all exposed to the truth. But these on the good ground, they accepted it. They, they bore fruit. And it says some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. These heard the word, they accepted the word, and they all bore fruit. The gospel had an effect on each and every one of them. It changed them. It didn't say some bore fruit. It didn't say some only some bore fruit and others did not bear fruit. It said all bore fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100. But all four seeds heard the gospel. Some received it with joy. Some even started growing. Some started growing from the gospel. Some received it with joy. But only one seed received the word as the true word of God, inspired and authoritative. Only one seed recognized the word of God having the authority over their life, and they obeyed it and were changed by it. Paul says, not only are you living not only can we see the evidence because you, you're imitating the church, you're being persecuted for it. You're being persecuted. Look back at 14. It says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God who are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things as your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. They were being persecuted. They're being persecuted for their faith, for their beliefs. They're being persecuted in, in Judea. All those who believe, they're, they're being persecuted just like the apostles. Just like Christ was persecuted and killed. He says, I know you received it as truth because you're willing to suffer for it. People don't suffer for things that they're not passionate about. People don't suffer for things that they don't truly believe. Thousands and thousands of people die for their faith. But we act like this is out of the norm. We act like this is a crazy concept that people are persecuted for their faith. We, we, we read about a persecution and we think, that, that's a rarity. That, that never happens. No, wrong. People all throughout history have suffered and died for their faith. People like William Tyndall. How many of you know who William Tyndall is? William Tyndall was executed for his faith. But thank, you better be thanking God today for men like William Tyndall, because William Tyndall is the man that's given credit for translating the Bible into a version that we can read today. William Tyndall is the man who translated the Bible into English, the Bible that you and I read today. And he was executed for living out his faith. I thank God for bold men and women who stood, and they stood against the evil of all the world. They stood against persecution, and they persevered. They were executed, but... God is on his throne. He uses people like that. They might be martyred. They might be killed. But glory be to God that we have an English version of the Bible today because of people like William Tyndall. There are so, so many others. I can't go through the list. There are hundreds of thousands of people throughout history who stood boldly against persecuted and were martyred for their faith. It's believed over 900,000 Christians have been martyred in the last decade. 900,000. We're not talking about just random people. We're talking about Christians. People who profess Jesus Christ. 900,000. It, it, that's about 100,000 a year, that number. I, I looked at two different statistics. Another one said it's on average 100,000 Christians are martyred a year for their faith. That's 274 every day. 11, 12, 13-ish an hour. One every six to ten minutes. During the duration of this service, that's 12 to 15 people will die during the dur duration of this service for their faith. 12 to 15. If we claim to be a New Testament church, why are we so different from the New Testament church in the Bible? Why are we so different? Why do they face death boldly, and proudly, thanking God that they're accounted worthy to suffer for his name, but yet we're scared to tell our neighbor. Why are we scared to tell our family or friend about it? We're scared to engage somebody with the gospel. We're scared to tell them our testimony, but yet the New Testament church in the Bible was willing to die for it. 
Why does the church in America today look so different from the New Testament church in Scripture? Is it because we live in a Christian nation? There's no Christian nation. No, the, the nation, this nation is not. It may have once been founded under God. We have been long removed from that. It's because the gospel message isn't offensive to anybody anymore. It's because we're not going out and proclaiming this message like they were, right? It says that they were persecuted in verse 14. It says, we also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. This is their own people persecuting them. Why are, they, why are their own people persecuting them? Because they're telling their own people. They're giving them the true gospel, and they're being persecuted for it. This is, I'm going to go tell my brother, my sister, my next-door neighbor, my friend, my coworker the truth. Even though the truth may hurt, i got to tell him because heaven is real, hell is hot, and eternity is forever. I have to tell him because we're not promised tomorrow. That's why they were being persecuted. They were being persecuted because they weren't afraid to share the gospel message. Paul says, if you didn't really believe it, you wouldn't suffer for it. You, you wouldn't be persecuted for it. I, I know that your seed that fell on good ground. I know that, 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 that you really received God's word the right way because it's evident in your life. Paul knew they received the word as the authoritative word of God. Because he saw the results. They, they, they were living it. The reality is, not everybody received the word that way. The reality is, there's other seeds. The reality is, the gospel message isn't received correctly amongst everybody. Verse 15 and 16 says, They do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. The, the gospel message is offensive. People don't want to give up their, their fleshly lives. It's, it's hard. It's painful. That's why people are persecuted for their faith. That's why they killed Jesus. That's why they killed the apostles. That's why they're persecuting the chest, church of Thessalonica. And that's why the churches everywhere around the world are still being persecuted because they're living out their faith. Paul said they have, they have forbidden us to speak the gospel message. In verse 16, he says, for, for forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. Why? Because it's an offensive message. They don't want to hear it. It's, it's offensive. The people who persecute God, God's church, will, will face God's judgment. They, they will face God's wrath one day. When they step into eternity and face God, God will judge them according to their works. That's what he's saying. The, the church was persecuted in Bible days. It's still being persecuted today. They're, these people are living sin-filled lives. They're, they're rejecting the message of Christ, and they're persecuting the church. He said they have filled their lives so full of sin. He says, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. To fill up the measure of their sins. He said they have filled their lives so full of sin, if, if, their, if their life was a cup and the sin was in the cup, the cup would be running over with sin. The sin in their life is overflowing. And God's wrath is stored up for them on the day of judgment. God will judge them. Paul's saying, don't you worry about them. You keep being strong. You keep running the race. You keep fighting the fight. God will judge them. Don't worry about them. You keep being strong. God will judge them in the end. They will stand before God one day, and God will administer his judgment. But the reality is, there's other people who didn't persecute the church that are still going to stand and face a holy God in judgment. The reality is, these people are going to face God's judgment for persecuting the church. But the reality is, is these other seeds that rejected the message, even though they received it, they didn't receive it as the authoritative word of God. They didn't obey it. They're going to face the same judgment from God. That's the reality. The reality is that, that there will be others who don't persecute the church that, that people say good things about. The, the reality is that there will be people who die. And at their funeral, people will say good things about them because they did good and honorable things during their life. But they rejected the message of Christ. Therefore, they will still stand before the same God and face the same wrath of God. The reality is that that's the truth. There's going to be people who 
who people think that they led good lives, they were good people, and they're still going to spend an eternity apart from God because they didn't receive the message the right way. Matthew 7, 21, I read it at the beginning of the service. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father. What's the difference? The difference is obedience. The difference is a changed life. We talked about the four different ways to receive the word this morning. All four seeds received the message in very different ways. But the reality is, is there's only two types of people. The reality is those who receive the word of God as the true word of God and understand that it is the ultimate authority over their lives and, and, and bow down before Christ and, and live an obedient life, repentance of sin, those people will spend an eternity in heaven. The reality is, is that there are other people who, who understand who Christ is. They have a head knowledge. They even believe that Christ was the Messiah. They believe that he was crucified on a cross. And they believe that he was resurrected on the third day. But there's no repentance in their life. There's nothing really changed about them because the word of God has no authority over their lives. And they will spend an eternity in hell. Those people are in churches in America everywhere. Everywhere. The reality is, is that after this life, you will stand before the creator of heavens and earth. You will. You will give an account for your life. It's going to happen. The reality is, is that if we receive the word of God like verse 13 describes it, it has to have an effect on us. The message we've heard, if, if the message we have heard has no effect on us, if, if it hasn't changed our lives, which seed are we? If it hasn't changed who we are, which seed are we? Every Sunday morning I say the same thing. I say, please stand in reverence for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. But do you believe it? Do, do you even know what that means? God's holy word. God is holy. And because the Bible says that this is the inspired word of God, it is God's word. These are, these are literally God's word given to man to record for us. Because God is holy, therefore his word is holy. Inspired is God breathed. These, these are God's words to us. This is what God wants us to know about himself. And an error is errorless. Because it's God's word, and he is without error, because he is errorless, therefore his word is errorless. Every Sunday morning we stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and an error word. But do we actually believe it? Do we actually believe it enough to let it have an effect on our lives and literally let it change our lives? The reality is, is that if we really believe the word of God, it would change who we are. It would change us. We would be like the Thessalonians in verse 13 who received the word of God. They welcomed it as the real word of God and it effectively worked in them to make them imitators of Christ. If we say we believe the word of God, how come we don't read it? How come we don't read it? How much time do you spend in God's word every day? How much time do you spend in God's word every week? How much time? There, we talked about this a week ago. Out of the 24 hours in a day, it came down to like you have five hours left, right? How much time do you spend reading God's Word? How much time do you spend pouring into it and, and diving into the Word of God to understand what God has for you? The reality is thousands and thousands of people in America hear the Word of God, yet it has no effect on them. No effect on them at all. The reality is this is the real reality. Christians today, they don't take God seriously. They don't take sin seriously. They don't take the Bible seriously. They don't take church seriously. And they don't take eternity seriously. That's the reality. Here's why. If, if we took God seriously, we would humble ourselves before a holy God out of fear and reverence. We've lost fear and reverence in the churches. If we took prayer seriously, our prayers wouldn't be so selfish. They wouldn't be all about us. There's another way to pray than just God, me, 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 me. There, there's another way to pray. If we took church seriously, we would pray for the church services every single day of the week leading up to Sunday. 
When's the last Monday you prayed for Sunday morning? When's the last Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday you prayed for Sunday morning and the Holy Spirit to show up and God's word to go out and somebody be affected by it? God to show up and move in his church. If we took church seriously, we would prepare our hearts and minds before service on Sunday morning. When's the last time you got up on a Sunday morning thinking about service, preparing your heart and mind for service in prayer, and maybe even reading God's word before you go to church? When's the last time you really prepared to hear from the word of God? To, when's the last time you prepared your heart to hear from God on Sunday morning? We don't prepare ourselves to hear from God, but yet we want God to show up on Sunday mornings. We want to live however we want to live. We don't want to spend any time in his word. We don't want to spend any time in prayer, but we want God to speak to us when we get here. That doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. If you want to be moved by the word of God, spend all week praying that God would speak to you on Sunday mornings, and he'll show up, and he'll speak to you on Sunday mornings. If we took church seriously... We wouldn't come to church and think, I didn't like the second song. It didn't, didn't speak to me. The, the pastor was too long-winded. He preached on something that I didn't like. What am I doing after this for lunch? If we took church seriously, we wouldn't think those things. We wouldn't say things like, well, the, the service wasn't very spirit-filled this morning. I wasn't really moved by the service. If we took church seriously... We would pray throughout the week. We would, we would humble ourselves and pray for God to move and work in his church. If we took sin seriously, we would stop sinning in those areas. If you take it seriously, you can't have pet sins. If, if you took sin seriously, you would try to stop. You'll never stop sinning completely. But there are areas of your life that you sin in that you could eliminate through God's power and through prayer. You would fight the temptations. You would pray to God for power to quit. If we took sin seriously, we would bawl our eyes out before God. Because you would recognize truly how wretched we are. Then that we have sinned against the Holy God. If you took sin seriously, it will begin to sicken you to your core. If you have a real relationship with Christ, sin in your life and around you will begin to utterly sicken you. It will sicken you. If we took the Bible seriously, we would actually spend time reading it. If we really believed and understood what was in the Bible, and we didn't just receive it shallowly, if we really believed what we're reading, it would have an effect on us. We would read it. If we took eternity seriously, if we took hell seriously, eternity seriously, we wouldn't be very afraid to tell our next-door neighbor. We wouldn't be really afraid to tell our relative who we know is lost. We wouldn't be afraid to, to live a life according to God's word in front of them. We wouldn't be so fearful of their rejection and persecution because we understand the reality of their situation. It's time that Christians and churches everywhere started taking God seriously, started taking sin seriously, started taking the Bible seriously, started taking eternity seriously, because nothing else in life matters. It's time we start taking the Word of God seriously and praying that the Word of God would have an impact on our lives like it had an impact on the Thessalonian church. The word of God impacted them. They received it. They welcomed it as the true word of God. They believed it deep down. This wasn't a superficial believing. They believed it enough to die for it. They believed it enough to sacrifice for it. And it was evident because they became imitators of Christ. And they were being persecuted for it. It's time that we start praying that God would impact our lives. That the word of God would impact our lives like it impacted the apostles, like it impacted the church of Thessalonica. Has the word of God impacted your life this morning in that manner? Which seed are you this morning? 
Have you received it with joy shallowly when something doesn't go your way? You return, you, 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 you turn away from God. You don't, I don't, I don't need God anymore. Are you good ground this morning? Are you good ground that's willing to suffer for your beliefs? Are you good ground that received the word and you obey the word? There's coming a time in this church in, in America, there's coming a time in America that the churches may be persecuted. Are, are you going to be the ones that, that turn away and leave the faith? Are you going to be the ones who stand your ground and you fight because you truly believe it? Because the word of God has authority over your life. That was the church of Thessalonica. I pray that we are the church of Thessalonica. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you again this day. Lord, we've read your text. Lord, there are thousands and thousands of people that are going to profess the name of Christ. They'll cry out, Lord, Lord, to you. And you will say, depart from me, I never knew. The, the gospel message had no impact on them. The Bible, the, the word of God had no authority over their lives. They received it, but they refused to obey it. That's the difference. Lord, I pray that we are a church like Thessalonica. I pray that we are a church that receives the word of God on good ground. That we be that it has an effect on our lives. I pray that we're a church that, that is impacted by the gospel message, that we become imitators of Christ. Father God, I pray that you would let that message have a greater impact on me. Lord, I pray that your message would continue to have an effect on my life, that I would continue to turn, that I would continue to surrender to you, that I would continue to give you more and more of my life every day. But God, there's no greater joy in this world than to walk with you in obedience and, and Lord, even though it can be difficult, it can be hard, I've never faced the level of persecution that these men and women have faced, but God, I thank you for them. I thank you for men like William Tyndall. There's so many others, God. I thank you for raising up godly men and women who weren't afraid of persecution, who weren't afraid of tribulation because they had a real relationship with you, God. Their lives were impacted every single day because they were walking with you. They were following you. You were leading them. God, I pray that you would do that in our church, do that in your congregation. I pray that you would lead me in that way. Strengthen my relationship. Give me the faith that these men have. God, I pray that there's somebody in here today that has received the word in a, a way other than good ground, in a way that's other than fully trusting in you, surrendering their lives, recognizing sin, repenting of sin, letting that gospel message truly change who they are. I pray that God, there's nothing I can do anymore. I'll all I've done is stand here and give them your word that you spoke through me. Lord God, it's all you. I haven't done anything. It's all you this morning, Lord. Open their eyes. Open their eyes and let them see the truth. Show them who you are. Show them who they are. Show them the reality of the situation, the reality of sin in their lives. God, I pray the text over the church. I pray that your word would have an effect on the people in this church, that we would all become imitators of Christ. Lord, I ask this in the name above every other name. 